So, interventional cardiology has sort of uh, uh, in, uh, affected various areas of the heart because heart is a very complex organ. So, you have coronaries. So, if you have a coronary problem, you need a plumber, you need a plumbing uh, intervention. You can electrical problem, you need a heart electrician. So, it depends on the abnormality. If you have a back problem, you need an endovascular or a structural intervention, which is going to. And if you have a heart muscle disease, you need a heart failure interventionist or a transplant or an assist device specialist. Because, or sometimes you can have an aortic disease, such as an aortic dissection, where you need an endovascular interventionist. So, interventional cardiology has uh, developed in a very, very big way. It's no longer interventional cardiology. If you go to any other country other than India, interventional cardiology, there will be various subspecialties. What are the practical problems with uh, therapy delivery? Most of these people are sick, are sometimes uh, old, and as a result of being old, they are sick. Treatment requiring open chest procedures, anything open heart, which has very good evidence is risky in these patients, often associated with renal and sometimes other system disorders and quality of life. Long gone are the whole idea of uh, operation success and the Paratla Pakrama and Dr. Vila on the operation success. You know, who cares? It's about quality of life. If the quality of the life of the patient cannot be made any better than what it was before that operation, that operation is a waste of time. Therefore, there's no point in doing an operation. Operation is successful. So, it it's about common sense. It's taken a holistic view. What can I do to make this patient better? Walking, better walking, better running, better quality of life. How can his family enjoy him much better than how he was before? That is the whole idea of interventional cardiology, and that's where the world is moving. 
sometimes get the therapies, we'll talk about it, is minimal inflation and now there is no open chest and early recovery. Because of this, this is my area of interest and in all the work that I do is on uh, minimally invasive and less insult to the poor heart and quality of life. Because of uh, the huge area of expansion, interventional cardiology has four major sub-specialities, Department of Coronary Intervention, just plumbing, Department of Electrophysiology, just electrical work, percutaneous valves and structural interventions, mainly changing valves, changing the aorta, ASD, BSD, and uh, pump support, heart rate assist devices. Coronary disease, there's a lot of uh, myths around coronary artery disease. Uh, apologies, but feel free to ask me questions anytime this interrupt me. It's the commonest cause of heart disease. We all see it every day. It's often multi vessel It's often labeled that CABG is permanent. Many surgeons, so long, and I've seen them say, CABG permanent, uh, stent to put a temporary. One again, I'm not stent to win a CABG. So, of course, the patient's good. That's all an absolute lie. It no longer exists. The fact and the worldwide data is that multivessel disease, left main, doesn't matter. They both revascularize. If you can achieve revascularization by an experienced interventionist, you achieve the same outcome in terms of mortality, stroke, and death. And in fact, you achieve better quality of life. 95% of current intervention that I do are all patients who have been referred for surgery and then they come to me and that's all I do. So I'll show you some examples. So this is uh, the coronary tree. I'm sure uh, you all know that. This is the right coronary artery, left coronary artery. This is a 42, a 40, 40 year old chap. It's about two years ago. He had triple vessel disease. All three vessels had a problem. Triple vessel disease, CABG goes away. CABG is not a permanent, there is no cure. It's palliation. CABG also, you can have a problem. If you can fix something without opening the chest, that is the best way forward. So you can see here, the right coronary artery is secluded. This is the LAD that runs in the front of the chest. That's also narrowed. And this is the circumflex that's run at the back of the vessel. That's also narrowed. So this is uh, what we did. We fixed the right coronary artery, completely fixed. The LAD is now fixed and circumflex also fixed. This is all in the same sitting and the patient goes home the next day, literally the next day. We have now followed this patient for two years. Treadmill is uh, negative and he's asymptomatic. This is a, another patient. Sometimes you have complete occlusion. This is the LAD. LAD, you should see a vessel running here, a very, very large vessel. It's occluded completely. So to do an intervention, intervention panorama, you need to be able to see the vessel distally where you can put a wire and put a stent. If there's no wire, you don't know. If, if there's no vessel, you don't know where to go. So that's what we call a CTO, which is chronic total occlusion. So in here, LAD should come here. We don't know how to go. So we go because the patient was referred for surgery. This, is, this patient is a doctor, uh, by the way. So we decided to uh, try and open up here. We could not go anywhere. So there's another way. You can go back, you can come to the right coronary artery, from the right coronary artery, find the collateral and go back and then re -canalize. So this is a retrograde technique whereby the patient can have it. So you build up on similarly and you pick one off and then you fix it. So this is so what we do. Uh, this patient is 18 months follow-up, treadmill negative and the patient is asymptomatic. Uh, this is uh, another doctor, he's a HIV. This is triple vessel disease. You can see, you can see in here, in here, I saw some also coming through. Uh, you can see this very tight narrowing. Uh, you can see severe disease of the LAD and a critical narrowing here. And you can see this right coronary artery, severe disease here. So triple vessel disease, he's a cardiologist. He knows that triple vessel disease is a, uh, CABG, but he thought, he came here, so we saw him, so we said, oh, don't worry, we can fix everything, and uh, you'll have the same outcome. So this is his LED now, completely fixed. This is his circumflex, again, fixed. And this is his right coronary artery. Just to give you a comparison, this is the pre, this is the post, 
This is the pre and this is the post. This is the pre and this is the post. This is all in the same sitting. The patient goes up the next day and now this is 12 months follow-up, asymptomatic and now he practices more evidence-based cardiology. Uh, this is uh, another HOD in SRM, uh, so he had left main disease. Left main disease, the rule is surgery. No, it's not. Left main, we can do a fantastic intervention. They do pretty much the same as surgery. So that is a fact. This is double blind random study. Study will I don't want to go, but uh, you feel free to ask me later. So this is the uh, left main, and uh, this is IVIS. All interventions, 100% uh, of are IVUS based. The reason why we use IVUS, I will show you in a second, because these angiograms are all uh, shadows. Basically, it's two-dimensional shadow. You give a dye, you see on X-ray. So this is just a two-dimensional picture. You cannot get a three-dimensional appreciation. The best way is to sit inside the vessel and see where the disease, so that your stent is perfectly fitted. Side pocket or a suit fit for it more as opposed to a, a ready-made park avenue suit. So you get a perfect fit. And the best interventions are IVUS guided and the best long-term results, which is similar to CABG, is only achieved by IVUS guided intervention. All 100% of our intervention, I don't do any current intervention without IVUS. So this is the pre and this is the post. All fixed, the patient goes home the next day. This is him, pre, and this is post. You can see the difference left main. And this is the reason why we do IVIS. So this is a, an IVIS in a patient who had intervention in another center. So this is the vessel. If you look at the stent, the stent is actually hanging. The stent should be against the wall. If you put a drug eluting stent, although the well of the drug should be eluted into the vessel wall. And the only way you will elude is if you sandwich the stent up against the wall. There is no way you can confirm that with an angiogram. An angiogram is a shadow. The only way you can confirm that is by doing intracoronary imaging, which is either do an OCT or an IVUS. Fancy names, but essentially you sit in the vessel and have a look. But that we do in every single case. So here you can see we have expanded it. Now it's up against the wall. When it's up against the wall, it eludes. That's when it works. Recent interventions don't work, they get instant v stenosis, narrowing again is because the stent is not a post well or there is an inflow or an outflow pathology which you can never see on uh, angiogram, only on IVUS. So if you do all the intervention on IVUS, you never get more than that. That is the general uh, uh, observation. So this is a, another patient. Sometimes we get uh, intermediate uh, uh, lesions. Either pananoma, panavenoma, patient has mild shortness of breath. So you don't know whether this is actually causing a problem. Sometimes you can put a stem very easy. You will just make the vessel pretty, but will cause no useful difference to the patient. How do we find out? Well, we, we do a pressure study. Pressure study is fairly straightforward, which is basically you measure the pressure here, measure the pressure here. If the pressure here and here are the same, then this is not causing a problem. If the pressure here is less than here, you put a stent. Very simple. And the idea of the pressure wire, after you put a stent, you know that you corrected the pressure. So this is a pressure wire. This is uh, 0.75. The magic number is 0 0.80. 0.80 to matter either now you don't need to put a stent. So here, this was a very calcified lesion, so we put a drill, this is a drill going in, we drill the entire vessel, and we put a stent, and uh, once, this is the pre, and this is the post, and after the drilling is done, the pressure uh, normalizes. Then uh, this is a, a politician, and, uh, he had severe disease, the entire lady is severely diseased, full of calcium, uh, so uh, angioplasty is not possible because if you have a lot of calcium full of rock, you cannot stretch it because rocks don't stretch, it only breaks. So the way you can fix it is, uh, is you put a drill. So you put a drill, you drill the entire vessel, and once you drill the entire vessel, the rock will be churned into fine pieces. You know, it, it's rotating at a 200,000 revolutions per minute, and therefore 
the calcium will be broken into small particles, smaller than red cells, and they flow away. And once this is uh, completely drilled, we can reconstruct the vessel, and this patient is doing well. This is another patient uh, we did uh, just uh, recently, uh, a few days back. You can see here, the right is here, there is no left coming out, you can see here, left is filling like this. So here there is no way you can go anti green and open. So we start from the right side, find the collateral, go back up, then again this is the right, connect the left, go back into this vessel. So we have two guys, one at the left, one at the right, right level police, left and come back, get the wire out, snare. So you hear, you, you see, this is why, it, 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 this is a beauty, it almost looks like a heart, you see. So from the right you go and into the left, and uh, you complete the intervention, put sense, and uh, you get this beautiful LED. This LED was never existing until 15 years ago. 15 years I had chronic total occlusion, concluded for surgery, came, did the entire thing. Took about five and a half hours, but still, the patient goes home the next day, you get the same result. So this is pre- no LED, this is post beautiful LED. So in coming up disease, all the patients should be assessed by an experienced interventionist. Heart team discussion is useful. PCA is no different to CABG. I'm very open for any questions there. And quality of life. And after 60 years, Camilla, who cares about longevity? It's about quality of life. 60 years, Camilla, in fact, I don't even tell patients, we are the supper, the supper. Whatever the guy ate, he 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 50 beats per minute and age predicted heart rate. Age predicted heart rate is usually 220 minus age. So if you have a tachycardia, you can have heart failure. If you have a bradycardia, you can have heart failure. If your electrical wiring system is broken, which you have LDB, then you can have heart failure. So if you have a tachycardia, it's usually a regular tachycardia is due to an electrical circuit and ablation is the best way of cure, which is only regular tachycardia. Irregular tachycardia, there's no circuit. Uh, this is an EP study. I will go very quickly in interest of time. This is the EP navigation system. This is all boring. I won't go into this. If it's bradycardia, you can put a pacemaker. Sometimes an ICD is needed. You can see this patient had LAD stent and an ICD. Uh, and bundle branch block. So if you have a left bundle block, the left ventricle should have two wires. Something like this. So if you have normal left ventricular contraction, then it goes like that. If you have an LDB, then electricity comes to the right, and from the right it moves to the left. And therefore, it's no longer like that, it's like this. So if you have that, you will ne never eject blood out, and that's why you put a wire on the right, put a wire on the left, and that's CRT. So it's essentially rewiring of the heart in LDB. And this is a CRT cartoon, and you get synchronous contraction. Iotic diseases, I'll be very quick, this is an aortic uh, uh, dissection, you can see, uh, this is a CT multiplane reconstruction, and this is the post endovascular, completely endovascular reconstruction, this is three years before, and the patient does very well. Uh, this is another dissection, horrible dissection, previous graph is there, and we just sent it from there to here, and uh, the patient is doing very well. EVAR, this is just a cartoon of uh, endovascular aortic uh, and you have repair. Usually you have to go from both sides, but if you have peripheral vessel disease, such as uh, these, you can see typical example of horrible peripheral vascular disease. You can go from one side. We go from one side, put this, and through here, we construct this. And this was done about last year, and that was uh, India's first single side EVAR, which I published uh, last year. Uh, what about valvular heart disease, plumbing pathology, electrical pathology? Let's move on to valvular heart disease. Uh, Iotic stenosis is the commonest uh, uh, valvular heart disease we see in the elderly. Conventionally, it's open chest, take the valve out, put a new valve in, and uh, this is surgical ABR, fantastic outcomes. Now, that may not be necessary. We can do 
uh, a kind scatteragic of implantation for adexinosis. The evidence for this is building. Currently, in 2017, in the last one year in the US, for aortic valve disease, the maximum treatment is tower. Surgery is lower. So the paradigm has shifted already. In India, we haven't moved because of costs, but that's changing too. The worldwide evidence from randomized trial is very good. Talking about randomized trial, valuable of heart disease lab, so far there has never ever been a randomized study. The world's biggest ever randomized study in valvular heart disease is to compare TAVI and surgical uh, adequate replacement and those studies have shown that TAVI is no inferior to surgical ABR. Therefore, anybody medium or high risk is better off with TAVI, not with surgical. And the medium high risk can be contributed with it. There's a lot of scoring system that I only learned it five years ago. So what is it in practical terms? Who can be considered for TAVI in India? So anybody beyond the age of 65 who has symptomatic adexinosis should be considered for a TAVA. Anybody who had previous CABG or valve surgery or previous bioprosthetic valves, if they have a tissue valve that degenerates usually 8 to 10 years, the best treatment in a tissue valve is to go for a valve in valve TAVI. Poor valve function, increased frailty. And frailty is an important point. If you are if 60 and you are walking like that, as a frailty score, you can do a frailty score, frailty score better, is higher, the better of the tower. What about pulmonary valves? You can see the, 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 the tetralogy palate is a common cyanotic heart disease. They all have total corrections as a child, but child life, they have a homograft. But the homograft doesn't grow when you grow, and therefore when you're 13 or 14, you have to have a redo a surgery. But now that is not necessary. You can have it done uh, here, predominantly under local anesthesia and conscious sedation. They can go home uh, the next day. This is a patient who needed a plumbing and also electrical work. You can see a tarry, uh, a stent put in, and AV node ablation, and a pacemaker done all, and the patient went well. This is just a stable patient. What about very, very sick patients? Sometimes we have sick patients transferred from elsewhere. This is a patient who had uh, aortic uh, uh, tarry performed elsewhere, but uh, ended up having uh, we have another two, three minutes. Yes. Okay. So this patient, uh, TAVI was not functioning well because it was uh, oversized. The patient was 78. So very old patients, sometimes intervention is risky, but then if they don't have any better option, intervention is the only hope. Sometimes we do take up very risky patients. So this patient's TAVI was not working. You can see here uh, significant uh, AR through the TAVI. This is because the TAVI valve was oversized. We need to replace the valve, but the valve is already there. So what do we do? We have to just pull the whole TAVI out, put a new valve. So here, you can see, we just uh, put a snare, hold the valve. This is another snare, so hold it on two ends and pull the whole thing down through the arch and then down into the descending aorta. And here you can see we're just pulling this uh, valve. And this valve is just pulled down and parked somewhere in the descending aorta and uh, we go through the valve again. This is all purely controlled fluid control, multiple control systems, so they are constantly watching everything. Sometimes to carotid filters are parked in the carotids too, to yeah. prevent strokes. And another tabby is taken up because we've taken the valve, we've got a new valve, and uh, uh, the patient uh, had another valve done, and uh, he did very well. This is uh, the final result. And this patient uh, continues to do very well, and he was one of the uh, local anesthetic tabbies performed in Tamil Nadu first. Uh, is is tabby just for old people? No, we can even do it for young people. I think Joy Verghese's patient was one of uh, India's first, youngest tabby patient ever. He had liver disease, he had liver failure, he needed liver transplant, but had severe artery vegetation. So we did a tabby, then he underwent liver transplantation. Now, two and a half, three years now, he's doing very well, and uh, this is one of the cases that we published. Uh, this is a, an extreme case. This is a 70 year old man, uh, severe adexinosis, uh, very high risk of uh, surgical area. His EF was about 10%. Uh, 
I'm sure you'll all agree, he had very, very poor ventricle. In the mild ventricular, when you do rapid pacing, when you do high-end intervention, suddenly the heart stops. I've had two patients who died on the table. So they are already high risk. So sometimes, so what we do is uh, we go on artificial pump. So we do the CT analysis. This is a uh, ECMO. Uh, everything is proteomically done. There's no surgery here. So we put a venous cannula, and then we put an arterial cannula here, and the tally is performed completely on ECMO support. And after the tally is done, the ECMO is removed, and the patient is extubated. You can see the remarkable uh, difference. See the ventricular difference contraction after the valve is done. And that was uh, India's first ECMO assisted TAVI performed too. This was about one and a half years ago. The patient does very well now. Uh, 65 year old lady, she had a CMV, metallic MVR, MVR, and biprosity valve capacity, TBR, already had four surgeries. And uh, she had a tricuspid valve which is a bioprosthetic valve, now that was dysfunctional. It had severe stenosis. Therefore, she had recurrent arthritis, recurrent admission. Now, if she has to have another tricuspid valve replacement, it will be her fifth surgery. Therefore, she was referred. What can we do about it? So you can see here, she has an ASD, which, uh, where the flow is completely from right to left, suggesting very high pressure in the right atrium. So uh, we analyzed her. This is a 4D TOE, and uh, under 4D guidance, uh, we did a transcatheter tricuspid valve implantation through a transjugular approach. So here, what you can see here, we are approaching uh, the right atrium from the IVC and from the SVC. We have a balloon from here, balloon from top, and within the valve, the previously implanted valve, you put another valve. That's called a valve in valve implantation. It's all done under percutaneous technique and allows the patient to be discharged in two to three days' time without open chest. Anyway, I won't go into the entire video because of time. And you can see straight away the hemodynamics changes. As soon as this is the valve now functioning normally, you can see the shunt is now from left to right, and uh, the patient did uh, well, and that was India's first tricuspid valve implantation. Uh, and this is a patient that uh, I just did uh, in Apollo, uh, an emergency patient had a severe mitral valve uh, dysfunction. The patient was too high risk, was in pulmonary edema, so the team was called, so we went in, assessed the patient. You can see here severe mitral regurgitation, so we punctured the left ventricle, went up, crossed the valve, and inside the valve put another valve, everything without opening the chest, without going on the pump and the first thing suture on LV is closed and uh, the patient recovered and is now three months post uh, valve implantation of mitral uh, and is doing very well. So you can see here uh, the valve positioning and that was NGS first trying to get the mitral valve. So is it just for patients advanced hospital? What about because a lot of times we get calls from patients who are in another center where there is no cardiac support, patient is in pulmonary edema, cannot be transferred, what do we do? We had a few problems with this, so we found that a, a virtual uh, heart failure team. Uh, this is a 65 year old auditor, LV at 15%, severe medical stenosis, had VT arrest in ICU on inotropes. You cannot shift the patient, he had a cardiac arrest that morning, what do we do? You know, when you shift, if he has another cardiac arrest, you cannot do CPR because nothing will get out, I have stenosis, and his LVEF is already 15%. So this is a lot of events. At about 7 a.m. we had the call, and about 7.10 the hospital facilities and the patient data is analyzed through an online system. And by 7.30 the teams are gathered, the retrieval team, we have a specific retrieval team, I get the whole team there, and the patient was assessed. And uh, this is the patient goes on ECMO percutaneously in a different hospital where there is no cath lab, no cardiac theta, no anesthetic support. We just go everything on local anesthesia. The patient is transferred. This is the ECMO machine connected. This is the schematic of the ECMO machine. So the patient is transported, brought back. The valve was changed. The vessels were fixed. The patient was discharged. And he did very well. Now this is a one and a half years post and he does very well. This is community ECMO support. So to conclude, heart failure mechanical support, I think drugs, beyond a certain point, drugs do bad. 
Inotropes are bad because when you use inotropes, they cause vasoconstriction, lactic builds up, and they get vasoplegia. Mechanical support, whether there's a mechanical problem, mechanical support is the one that helps most. Hyvus PCIs, VT ablation, TABA, all are done under ECMO now. Uh, another myth, again, aggressive treatments are risky and not indicated, but aggressive treatments are needed in very high risk patients. And I'm sure we'd all agree this is all aggression too, but it's needed. Only when it's needed with trained teams, aggressive treatments and aggressive intervention do make a difference. When we go into this, this is our team, and these are the ratio of virtual teams. Ethos of teamwork, together we stand divided before, and the idea is to improve and not to prove. We have two excellent presentations by two youngsters, but I have to uh, word of caution for these two youngsters uh, to be not too optimistic or too dogmatic in giving death sentences, especially the oncology said primary lung cancer six months. I have my own cousin who is living with a primary lung cancer more than three years. The oncologist himself is surprised, right? The dictum was told by the founder of Cancer Institute, Dr. Krishnamurti, when he was started at the institute in 1958, he was asked to give an opinion for a railway employee in a leukoplake equation. And he was asked to give a confidential report about this particular patient. And he wrote in the confidential report that this man is going to survive for only for five years in those days, way back in 58. Now, this man came to know about the confidential report to his friends. And after retirement, he went and met the doctor. He told, please, for heaven's sake, don't give that sentence. <laughs> I want you to emphasize, both of them are very enthusiastic, out of our age and wisdom, you don't give that sentence. It is desired by the Almighty. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that uh, surgery should go out of the surgery. So the outcome is poor. The only hope is medical management with disease-modifying drugs and anticoagulation. These are the two that has given consistent positive outcomes so far. No other treatment has uh, done a great job except palliation. Of course, in stage when there is a lot of right heart failure, we do septostomies, but that's palliation. That can only take the patient over for another year. Eventually, they do die. No. Diabetics, diabetic CABG better that used to be the case. This was the era of biometric step. Otherwise, there's still information is being passed, but that's not the case. If you do IVAS based intervention, multi disease, diabetics, they achieve similar outcomes in terms of mortality, death, and strokes compared to CBD. 64 slides can how reliable yeah, because most of the use from that where the clinical probability is low. If you have a young lady who's 45 who is menstruating, the chance of her having coronary disease is almost zero, we know that. But she's having some chest pain, she has a family history, I would put her through a CT because the clinical probability is low, ECG is low. When the clinical probability is high, I don't think CT is of any use, especially post CABG. Post CABG, you can see the graft is there. Graft the component native is written out of the here. So I think it's, it's, it has to be used with caution in the right patient. Post tent, maybe in very large left mains we do CTs because the, the stent is very big. There's not much artifact. You can see the lumen. But there's still a LAP, Kela, stent, Siris, Alhara, you cannot see anything inside. You'll have so much artifact. So it's, it's, it depends on the patient. Yes. Sure. Um, you said like uh, you know, anything with respect to the uh, coronary artery disease will be handled by the interventions. Is there any role for uh, then a cardiac thoracic surgeon in uh, uh, acute coronary syndrome? Sure. So, uh, first of all, I didn't say anything and everything. I didn't love it. Already, I was in the first one. So, what the I idea is most. What I said, as a surgeon, as a surgeon, I told you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, I should, why should I? No, that was a joke, by the way. Don't worry. <laughs> so, let me answer your question. Please feel free to give me any word of caution. I'm very open. I'll take it with all uh, respect. In terms of coronary disease, most, most can be managed with an intervention. It's only very few cases where interventions have failed, provided 
best intervention done, either scan intervention done, they fail, or intervention cannot be done as declared by an expert interventionist, yes, surgery can be done. Surgery now, there's no, it's all heart team, that's why I mentioned heart team. There is no such thing, I'm not an anti surgeon, I'm more pro patient. It's not about giving the patient to the surgeon. What is going to make the patient better is what matters. So, I just look at every patient as my dad. 65 years, uh, triple vessel disease, man, can be power surgery over my dad. If my dad, I'll fix all things. In fact, my dad did have left me. I sent it in eight years ago. He's doing very well. So, I don't uh, just preach, I do it too. Any questions?